Hi, good morning and good afternoon, good evening, where are you? Uh, welcome to the our high-level political forum 2023 official side event. Translating evidence to action on climate and SDG synergy in Asia and beyond. First, I'd like to thank the our co-organizer, Minister of Environment, Japan Moije, United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability, UNUIS. International Institute for Applied System Analysis, IASA, and International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD. And also, I would like to thank our partner, uh, United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC Secretariat. Uh, I'm Junichi Fujino, uh, Principal Researcher and also Program Director of the Integrated Sustainability Center, IGS Institute of Global Environmental Strategies. And today um, we will look for the uh, very best cases in from Asia or the world. And then uh, we discuss about how to you know, use evidence for the further actions. We have uh, 10 very interesting, uh, important speakers within 60 minutes. So then, uh, let's start, let's get started. First, I would like to invite His Excellency, Mr. Yanagi Moto Akira, Parliamentary Vice Minister of the Environment Japan for opening remarks. So your Excellency, uh, the floor is yours. Yanagi Moto Senkan, yoroshiku onegai itashimasu. Good morning to those participants in New York and good evening to the participants in Japan. My name is Yamajimoto, Vice Minister of the Environment of Japan. Let me begin by thanking the organizer of this event, the IGS and the co-sponsor for organizing this side event. I'm pleased to address you on behalf of co-sponsor, the Ministry of the Environment of Japan. There is a growing international attention on solutions that leverage synergies across multiple issues, and that is paramount to achieve SDGs. Japan holds the G7 presidency this year and the G7 Sapporo Ministerial Conference on Climate, Energy and the Environment held in April well documented the importance of synergies in the communique. Global Climate and SDG Synergy Conference held last year in Tokyo and yesterday here in New York highlighted the importance of synergies between climate change and biodiversity initiatives and the need to accumulate the lessons to promote the synergies. We are facing a global crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. These crises are interrelated Therefore, actions need to take place concurrently in tandem. Since this event will share practice, practices of synergies, I'd like to introduce some practices from Japan on the synergies between climate change and biodiversity. First, on biomass power generation combined with forest management, about 70% of Japan's land area is covered by forests, but in recent years, the do domestic forest industry has been declining. And in many years, forest upkeep has become less satisfactory. Chips made from outcuts and unmarketable woods are used to generate electricity to improve the economies of the forest industry and the forest management in the Maniwa city, Okaima prefecture, for example. This initiative not only significantly reduces CO2 emission, but also leads to biodiversity conservation and resilience to natural disaster and the vitalization of local industries and the communities. The second practice is the restoration of seaweed beds, also known as blue carbon. The town of Minami Sandiku Miyake prefecture is working to restore the seabed beds in the bay which is registered as the Ramza Convention Wetland. This initiative they will lead to conserving biodiversity and the seaweed, such as the eel grass, will serve as a source of seal absorption. Eco DRI is another best practice that promotes synergies. The Ministry of the Environment has prepared a guide to promote eco DRR and its implementation is underway. For example, in the Imbanuma, the watershed in Chiba prefecture, the lowland areas in the valley have been used as rice paddies, but in recent years, they have been abandoned and increasingly claimed and developed 
destroying these areas as wetland has brought about multiple benefits, including flood control, water purification, ecosystem conservation, local revitalization, and landscape creation. Also, actions to bring about synergies between climate change mitigation and solutions to social issues underway. Japan is working to create more than 100 decarbonized regions that will achieve net zero emissions by FY 2030. The goal is to solve social issues in these regions and achieve decarbonization while achieving economic growth. For example, the smell of manure from livestock farming has a negative impact on local residents and the tourism. By fermenting manure to produce meat and gas, which is then used to generate biomass power, we are simultaneously addressing the social issues of decarbonization and unpleasant smell. At this event, the international organization will present their synergies, actions, and the analysis. This event will be an opportunity to accumulate the practice of synergies in Asia beyond, which will provide input to the UN SDG Summit in September this year and the Summit of the Future next year. With that, I'd like to conclude my opening remarks by wishing to a successful event. Um, the um, best cases in Japan um, in detail, yeah, in compact. Thank you so much. Okay, then um, next I would like to invite the um, Professor um, Kazuhiko Takeuchi, uh, the president of IGS, and my boss <laughs> for, for having the, his um, framing presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Jage. Uh, I'm very pleased to, for this opportunity. Uh, to give you the present, uh, framing uh, presentation. Uh, we are in the midst of the decisive decade to be achieved by the year 2030. Uh, for example, uh, we need to achieve the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development goals. And we also have uh, many uh, different uh, uh, challenges, including the climate change and biodiversity loss. And uh, also uh, by the year 2050, we are uh, willing to achieve the net zero uh, globally, as well as the establishment of a society living in harmony with nature. And also we are in the uh, process of a green recovery from the COVID-19. Uh, so many uh, different uh, challenges we are facing, and therefore, uh, in order to effectively achieve these uh, goals and targets, uh, we also need to take a synergetic approach to accelerate progress and uh, raise ambition on these uh, global challenges. Next slide, please. Uh, synergies between climate and biodiversity action has been uh, emphasized uh, very recently. For example, in the Kumi Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which was adopted last year in Montreal, uh, they uh, uh, agreed to uh, aim to achieve the 30% of a terrestrial and as well as the 30% of the marine ecosystem uh, to be uh, conserved. And in order to do this, it is not enough by only by the protected areas, but also we need to emphasize the importance of the harmonious coexistence between the people and nature. And we have been uh, promoting uh, the Satyama Initiative in the last uh, 12 or 13 years uh, uh, since the COP10 uh, in Nagoya. And uh, uh, we are very successful in uh, uh, promoting these uh, international activities and very recently could have had a very important meeting in Akita in Japan and we decided to continue our efforts uh, to expand our activities not only in the field of uh, biodiversity but also in many other areas including the uh, climate mitigation adaptation and the sustainable uh, uh, food systems establishment as well as the achievement of the SDGs. Next slide please. Alas, uh, we all already have a, a very important meeting in Tokyo uh, uh, in 2022 uh, in the United Nations University. And uh, this uh, was a, a, a third uh, global climate and SDGs conference. And the fourth uh, conference was held just yesterday uh, here in New York at the UN headquarters. And during the third conference, we could get uh, several key outcomes. One is strengthening of the evidence base uh, for synergetic action. And uh, second is uh, uh, we need to uh, 
convening a multi-stakeholder dialogues at all levels. So participation of a different stakeholder will be a very, very important key to achieve uh, these uh, synergies. And also need to enhance the integrated planning and promote the partnership for uh, transformative changes and uh, informing key intergovernmental processes on climate and SDGs and also uh, the biodiversity and other uh, global challenges. Uh, recently, the Ministry of the Environmental Government, Japan, uh, has been promoting to establish decentralized circulating and ecological spheres, as well as uh, to promote the decarbonization of the cities and rural areas, uh, which need to be integrated in a, a very uh, uh, harmonizing manner. And the expert group on climate and synergies was established uh, very recently uh, by uh, UNDESA and UNFCCC. I was a member, uh, have been a member of this uh, 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 group, uh, try to uh, materialize our activities. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of uh, the uh, areas uh, with the potential synergies. One is a synergy between SDG 6 and 7. And as I already mentioned, regional circulating and ecological sphere could be a very important basis for combining of urban rural areas in uh, uh, where uh, people can exchange of uh, the materials and also the exchange of the people and so on, and to promote the decarbonization and the circular economy and to make uh, the society uh, living in harmony in nature. And in order to do uh, this, uh, we have uh, the uh, very important uh, uh, SDGs uh, uh, activities, uh, which is called the voluntary national reviews. And we are also insisting the importance of localizing the voluntary uh, uh, national reviews into the voluntary local reviews. And also uh, we are saying that participation of the business sector will be a key to achieve the sustainable development goals. And uh, also we need to respond to the world crisis, uh, uh, Ukraine crisis and uh, uh, food crisis and many others. And uh, these uh, issues uh, could be also uh, combined with the uh, uh, environment and uh, global security issues. Next, please. And I just has been uh, conducting the uh, research activities on the synergy uh, with the financial support of the Ministry of the Environment of Government of Japan, uh, which aims to follow up and review of synergies and strengthening the interagency coordination and also expanding stakeholder engagement, including the youth, women, parliamentarians, academia, and so on. This project has contributed to report and publication that stress uh, these uh, three subjects. And if uh, you are interested in, please uh, look at our website to see uh, the uh, concrete documents. Next slide, please. So these are the main points uh, to be discussed at today's event. One is, what is the evidence on synergies? And second, what is the action on synergies? And third, what can we translate, strengthen the connection between evidence and action on the synergies? Uh, it is uh, not so uh, difficult to say the importance of uh, uh, integration, but it is rather difficult uh, to uh, discuss uh, based on the evidence. And it is more difficult uh, to take an action to uh, realize the synergetic activities. And therefore, I'm very much looking for what uh, that today's uh, fruitful discussion and to get some uh, very important and concrete uh, results to move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, I'm Professor Takeuchi, for sharing the, the, our direction of the discussion today. Thank you so much. Okay, then now I would like to move to the next session to share the synergetic cases and the analysis. So we invite five uh, distinctive speakers. And so uh, let's get moved. And then uh, first, I would like to uh, invite uh, Ms. Maria Katerina Padu uh, or Ms. Kay. <laughs> Uh, Associate Program Officer, United Nations Environmental Program, uh, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, UNEP, ROAP. So um, over to you, uh, Ms. Kaysan. Thank you. Um, 
I'd be requesting if my slides could be shown on the screen. Um, colleagues, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, good morning, good evening from, uh, from Bangkok, from the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. Just wanted to express um, our appreciation um, to IGES and all the co-sponsors, co-organizers for inviting us to join this very important event. Um, for my brief intervention, I'd like to share some examples um, of aligning climate and clean air action as one of the opportunities for maximizing um, and demonstrating um, synergies. Um, as we know, the Asia-Pacific region is at the forefront of the triple planetary crisis of climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. Um, the adverse effects that we feel from climate change and air pollution are very much already upon us, and it affects people's health and livelihoods. And it adds significant pressures to already vulnerable ecosystems and communities, and challenging our ability to meet the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Our region, unfortunately, is not on track to achieve the sustainable development goals. And based on assessments for the region, we have seen regression in climate action and stagnating progress on addressing urban air pollution. Um, so looking at the synergies that are available for us to be able to maximize action, what could be a potential way forward? So we have increasing understanding that air pollution and climate change are closely linked, and many air pollutants have important climate impacts. Um, these linkages um, can multiply the cost of inaction, but they also serve as an opportunity for us to be able to amplify the benefits of our actions and even catalyze greater mitigation ambition. So one powerful way forward is to be able to integrate strategies and measures that consider all air pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, one recent example that I would like to share um, where we have done this is UNEP's support for the Ministry of Environment of Cambodia um, that was actually supported by the Ministry of Environment of Japan um, for the development of Cambodia's first national clean air plan. Um, and this was just launched um, in January of last year. Next slide, please. Um, Cambodia, as in other developing countries, um, economic development has driven an increase in emissions and in other um, environmental issues. Um, the country, as we know, is also vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Um, the government has put forward a um, commitment to address both issues, one of which is through the development of a clean air plan. Um, to support this process, um, an integrated assessment of air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions was undertaken to be able to identify the largest emission sources for the key pollutants in the country. Um, based on this analysis, um, which some of the results are highlighted in the slide, um, we were able to identify that residential transport and waste sectors contribute the largest share of air pollutant emissions in the baseline year of 2015. Without action, emissions could potentially increase by 50 and 150 percent in 2030. And most of these um, increases actually from the transport sector due to increased um, activity. Um, we've also undertaken identification of uh, a package of mitigation measures. And what we have tried to do, taking up um, an integrated approach, is combining um, a mix of existing policies that have already been adopted in recent years that contribute to reducing air pollution. And this is very important for us to be able to demonstrate that implementation of existing commitments is critical for us to achieve um, significant reductions. Um, we've also considered policies and commitments that the country has already taken to address climate change, recognizing its co-benefits with air quality action. And this has actually demonstrated significant co-benefits um, for the country. And then of course, we propose additional measures um, that were not yet considered um, within the existing policy commitments by the government um, that provide benefits for both air quality and climate. So for example, a policy recommendation to adopt Euro 4 equivalent standards for buses and for freight transport. Um, the assessment uh, also looked at what would be the potential benefits if we were going to fully implement the plan. Um, looking at both um, benefits, not just from an air quality perspective, also looking at it from climate commitments and also public health um, benefits. Um, so um, the assessment, for example, was able to demonstrate that the implementation of the plan 
um, could help reduce um, at least 60% of particulate matter and black carbon emissions by 2030 and also contribute to 19% reduction in CO2 emissions, contributing to Cambodia's climate change goal. And I'm very pleased to share that the um, support for the implementation of some of these mitigation measures within the plan have actually started, um, specifically on uh, vehicle emissions and fuel quality standards implementation and strengthening, and also on addressing emissions coming from garment factories. Next slide, please. Um, the final example I wanted to share um, with you today is how we've also demonstrated the opportunity for integrated climate and clean air action in the capital metropolitan region of the Republic of Korea. A new report that UNEP launched um, last month found that over the last 15 years, air quality levels in Seoul, Incheon, and Gyeonggi have actually improved significantly. Um, annual PM10 levels of uh, annual levels of PM10 have actually been um, 30 to 40 percent lower in 2021 compared to 2005. And this was, of course, um, a result of significant improvement in terms of air quality measures, legal framework, availability of long term air quality data, and financial investments. But one of the interesting things I, I wanted to share was that we found that there was still scope for future, for further action. The air quality improvements within the capital metropolitan region have not been achieved alongside reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. For example, um, the CO2 emissions have actually increased by 25% in the Republic of Korea. So we see this that um, in the coming years, the um, recent commitments to carbon neutrality would be able to provide reduction not only in greenhouse gases, but it could also help cut down um, air pollutant emissions within the capital and metropolitan area and in the overall country. So this is another opportunity to be able to demonstrate that addressing air pollution and climate change in an integrated approach is beneficial and can provide multiple benefits. Um, wanted to just finally highlight um, that it's also important um, for us to be able to implement and un undertake these integrated assessment to be able to identify the necessary engagement that we need from key sectors to be able to achieve emissions reduction. And this would also help us in terms of efforts to strengthen institutional arrangements and break down the silos that exist even within ministries and move towards a whole governance for climate and clean air. Um, just to close um, this intervention, I wanted to share with participants to I invite you to check out a guidance document that has been developed by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and many other partners um, to provide a framework on how to be able to conduct this type of integrated approach and hope that it might be useful for your purposes as well. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Kei San Ho. You are very um yes um uh, the latest the um present uh, presentation uh, the contents and then, uh, thank you very much for your long term um, collaboration with IJS and so let's work together uh continue to uh, work together. Okay, so and then today uh, I'm very much sorry, but we due to time constraint we cannot uh, uh, share any comments or question from the um, participants. But if you have, then uh, please contact our address or to send the email to me, uh, uh, Fujinata IGS or JP. Okay, then um, next I would like to invite uh, Doctor Dindu uh, Campira. Uh, Regional Director, uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature and the Natural Resources, IUCN, you know very well, I, I Asia Regional Office. So, uh, for his years, over to you, uh, Dindo san Thank you very much for the kind invitation. And uh, we at the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, are very honored for this opportunity to contribute to this dialogue on translating science and scientific evidence into action for climate and the SDG synergies. Uh, true to our mandate, IUCN champions the role of nature in achieving the SDGs. And the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda itself recognizes that the natural world and its life-giving services must be urgently protected if we are to fulfill the needs of 9 billion people in 2050. Our ICN program called Nature 2030 is a global call to action in committing to deliver clear and demonstrable contribution to the SDGs in synergy with global environmental goals and targets, including for biodiversity and climate. 
along with the global recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. So over the next decade, IOC and seeks to harness the power of the union over 1,400 members from states, including Japan, government agencies to NGOs and indigenous peoples, and our network of over 15,000 scientists and experts in the IUC and global commissions. Here in Asia and Oceania, we are nurturing partnerships with our 48 statutory countries to translate science-based evidence into actionable solutions for confronting the biodiversity and climate crisis as part of the regional effort for SDGs achievement. Now, in this regard, IUCN's vision is to place nature at the core of sustainable development pathways. By leveraging nature and the power of healthy ecosystems to protect people, optimize infrastructure, and safeguard a stable and biodiverse future. In short, a nature-based solutions or NBS. So one strategic starting point for today's dialogue could be in recognizing ecosystems as infrastructure, providing four types of services from provisioning and regulating to cultural and supporting. Now these benefits are not small and localized. Uh, nature, for example, can provide up to a third of cost effective mitigation by 2050. Now on NBS, allow me to quickly take you and take us all through IUCN's pioneering efforts in the development, application, and scaling of NBS. Yeah. In 2016, IUCN formally adopted and introduced the definition of NBS actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively while simultaneously providing human well being and biodiversity benefits. We must also give credit to how it's been informed, inspired, and further enriched in partnership with the countries and the underground efforts. And I was really glad at the beginning that we mentioned about Satoyama Initiative because definitely it has been one of the inspiration and cross learning we have with the global NBS concept. Satyama being a concept and a practice on societies in harmony with nature. This definition from IFCN also became the best basis for the NBS definition six years later at the 5th UN Environment Assembly in 2020, uh, 2022. Sorry. And earlier in 2020, the IFCN Global Standard for NBS was launched, and it's now the key reference to safeguard the use, assure the quality, and facilitate capacity building. Now, when delivered appropriately, NBS simultaneously provides multiple benefits to both people and biodiversity. For example, when you restore mangrove, it prevents coastal erosion, but also supports coastal fisheries and carbon storage, while, for example, a seawall would only address erosion. NBS helps tackle multiple SDGs, including SDG 13 in cl on climate action, of course but it also directly contributes to SDG 6 on water, 14 on life below water, and 15 on land. And this nature-based SDGs, or those which include nature-based indicators, are building blocks for achieving SDGs such as on one, no poverty, and two on zero hunger. Let me also mention, of course, the Conming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which calls for greater protection of ecosystem with an ambitious 2030 target at least 30% of areas of degraded ecosystems under effective conservation and management. I think this further incentivizes the application of NBS at scale. So how do we seek to achieve a more nature positive climate resilient world? It is important, of course, for planning at scale. And at the IUCN, there are four ways that we are offering in partnership uh, with the global community and these are, number one, on policy, technical assistance to countries in revising, harmonizing their plans, practice, expertise support to countries in operationalizing NBS to implement 30 by 30 targets, such as the use of the IUCN Greenlist Standard and other effective area-based conservation measures, OECM. Standard setting, providing the global standard and norms to ensure that implementation of good NBS meet the full criteria, including socioeconomic, ecological, inclusive governance, and policy integration. For this finance and attracting public and private funding for investment in NBS. As a GEF and GCF agency, the IUCN works closely with countries in developing and implementing large-scale NBS. Here in Asia, the examples would be our NBS scaling projects 
in Sri Lanka, Nepal, also those under development in the Mekong region and Indonesia. And of course, uh, on capacity building, the IUC and Academy offers practitioners, policymakers, investors, other stakeholders, the opportunity to earn a professional certificate on NBS. And we're indeed very encouraged to see emerging outcomes across the region in integrating investing and scaling NBS as, as part of overall sustainable development approaches. A good example comes from Vietnam, where NBS drives climate action in the Mekong Delta to promote transition from intensive rice production to flood-based agriculture. And the resulting increase combines benefits, not only income, but flood mitigation, groundwater recharge, sustainable fisheries, and arresting biodiversity. We also uh, would like to mention the bond challenge, the IUCN and the government of Germany initiative, which aims to restore deforested and degraded land. Uh, we take pride in Pakistan as the leader in the region, promoting its pledge in the billion, with a billion tree tsunami, restoring 350,000 hectares of forest, degraded land, and creating 85,000 green jobs in the process. So finally, the key message that IUC would like to bring to today's event is that our, uh, we put nature at the center of efforts to translate evidence into action and to achieve the SDGs, integrating ecosystems and their services in sustainable development is key. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Adindo san, for sharing the um, very best cases from the Asia Pacific. And then, as the uh, Mr. Yanagimoto Vice Minister uh, mentioned, and climate and biodiversity synergy is quite key. And then, uh, yeah, I just definitely would like to work further together with the um, IUCN, especially Asia Regional Office. So, thank you very much. Okay, then, uh, next cases, uh, I would like to invite the uh, the Dr. Samir uh, Deshka, uh, he's Associate Professor, Architecture and Urban Planning um, at Bisu uh, Besu Biraya National Institute of Technology, India, and he kindly sends the video. So let's uh, watch the video. A very warm greetings to all the dignitaries and the participants to this high level political forum and this side event being organized by the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. At the outset, my sincere thanks to all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present in front of you the work that we have been carrying out in the city of Nagpur. So basically today I will be presenting you on how we are concept conceptualizing and trying to apply the concept of the circulating ecological sphere for the localization of this integrated climate and sustainable actions. Uh, let me introduce you the city of Nagpur, which is located in the center of this India and uh, we have the extremes of the climate conditions uh, wherein the summers reaching up to the maximum of 48, 49 degrees, wherein we have the intense rainfall during the monsoons, uh, creating the situations of floods also. And then we have extremes of winter, sometimes the temperature going up to the four degrees Celsius. So a region which is with so varied climatic conditions also in the recent time is fastly growing as one of the uh, fast growing metropolitan city in the India. Uh, there are more and more infrastructures being added and with that there are more and more populations also thronging into the city uh, creating more pressures on the natural resources and thereby on the hinterlands also uh, for the want of uh, development of lands and the uh, procurement of resources uh, uh, with that uh, brief background we try to understand the needs of the local communities and the local developing units uh, trying to uh, seek how the concept of this uh, circulating ecological sphere can be taken at the local level. And uh, we interviewed a lot of uh, uh, communities and uh, the administrative uh, 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 representatives, uh, as well as the professionals who are engaged into the resource management and resource governance. So uh, in this exercise particularly, we try to identify what are the avenues uh, that we can uh, tap to implement the concept of the CES and where the partnerships can happen between the rural and the urban areas. Uh, there are three avenues that we try to understand. Uh, uh, the three methods through which we try to understand is that there are networks, which means that uh, action in one particular sector leads to some uh, implications for the other sector. And that if we manage this if, or if we tap on these particular linkages, then we can manage the uh, overall resources in this particular uh, aspect in the region. Uh, so, but however, the networks being uh, cutting across different political as well as the administrative boundaries, managing such uh, resources through the linkage approach becomes very difficult. 
The other was a sector specific approach wherein we uh, understand that only focusing on one particular resource can have more dedicated and focused actions. So governing water, governing energy, governing food could be independently looked at and therefore they could be managed uh, in, in that way. However, again, there are limitations to this approach because as I was mentioning, action in one sector could lead to the repercussions on the other. And the third approach that we try to understand is the spatial uh, level of the model wherein there are give and takes happening at a very uh, localized level because when we're trying to take the uh, actions at the local level, the local units become very, very important. And in that sense, the partnerships at smaller scales such as rural to rural, peri-urban to rural, peri-urban to urban, they could make more meaningful kind of intervention. So with these three different models and the sectors of identified uh, interventions, uh, particularly the energy and the water is what we try to understand. And uh, we carried out different analysis uh, indicating where are the lands suitable for carrying out these interventions, what are the units wherein we can uh, consider uh, for the engagements at different scales. And uh, we brought all these stakeholders together and had a co-design and co-development workshop, uh, which is primarily the most important feature of the whole CS approach because we're trying to have a localized kind of solutions to the larger problems. And through the interventions and the interactions during this particular workshops, we came across uh, different approaches and uh, different sectors that can be uh, looked at. So in the implementation of the CES, we are at the knowledge building stage. We just completed with that, wherein we had all the participants giving their feedbacks. And the next step will be to get into the formal agreement with the local governments because their engagement is very prime uh, in uh, implementation of any such kind of an actions. And subsequently, we'll be preparing uh, by the end of this whole uh, cycle, the CES action plan, and we'll be launching them in parallel to the other development plans over these particular regions. So uh, that is in very brief what we have been doing, and we'll be very happy to get your feedbacks. And thank you so much, and wishing uh, all the best for this particular event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samir, for your presentation and um, for sharing the cases uh, in uh, Nampu, India. Thank you so much. Okay, then next I would like to invite the, uh, Dr. Elena Robinskaya, a program director and the principal researcher scholar advancing systems analysis program EASA. So, uh, Elena san, um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have to share my screen. Um, yeah, and, and thank you also from my side to the organizers for inviting me to this very important event and greetings from Vienna, Austria. Um, it was also the main insights from the IASA Transformations Within Reach initiative that uh, to facilitate transformation uh, to sustainability, the approach of co-benefits uh, should be really taking between uh, development and achieving SDGs. So we started this initiative soon after the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, such that we wanted to learn uh, lessons from, from this uh, experience, from this new experience of COVID-19 and the new consciousness that emerged because of this. Uh, and we wanted to see how we could we could uh, learn from, from that very unusual experience that we had uh, and what can we then apply to the this more chronic disease of, of the world, which is the lack of uh, sustainable development. And indeed, we know that uh, complexity and uncertainty dominate SDG-related decision-making realities, and this makes it so-called wicked problems. Uh, there are several challenges, major challenges for the decision-makers in this regard. For example, one challenge is the multiplicity of choices which are available to policymakers. Empirical evidence shows that human brain's ability to make good choices actually declines sharply with the size of the choice set. So this is, this is one challenge. Another challenge is related to complexity of causalities involved in SDG-related policymaking. And here again, our brains are known to have limited capability to deal with complex causal feedback loops. There are more challenges. Uh, another one here is so-called ambiguity aversion. So this is uh, a phenomenon, a very widespread phenomenon that people's decisions are inconsistent with the uh, subjective expected utility theory, namely 
people prefer to take decisions when risks are known, even when these risks are high, compared to uh, decisions which, which lead to unknown risks, even in cases when those risks in the end become not that high. So these challenges and many others dominate the decision-making reality uh, related to SDG achievement. And this is why, of course, uh, researchers are trying to evaluate numerically uh, using different assessments or data or both uh, trade-offs and synergies between different SDGs. And this is just one example here on this slide, which I'm demonstrating. And we can see here uh, synergies and trade-offs between SDG 13, which is climate action that is the focus of this event and every other SDG here. And what we see is that indeed the, the complexities here are quite high and as well as uncertainty, because we see that uh, SDG 13, for example, has uh, mainly uh, synergistic effects to with uh, SDG 1, for instance, and SDG 11, but with SDGs 2, 3, 4, and so on here in this area, we observe quite strong trade-offs. So, so this kind of analysis can be really very helpful to, to uncover synergies and, uh, and, and trade-offs. And now I would like to show you an uh, example from another project at YASA. Uh, this is a specific project where we focus on the region of Central Asia and specifically on the country Kazakhstan. And we consider one promising action. So this event was linking evidence and action. So, so here we are investigating one action that can simultaneously pursue the development goals of the country and climate goals. And this action is carbon farming and trade. So here the context is, and you can see the map of Kazakhstan here on the right, that a big part of Kazakhstan's land is a degraded land, and especially in this area with dry steppe. So here, uh, this land offers a large carbon sequestration potential, uh, and this, this potential until now remains undiscovered, so to say. So a range of sustainable land management practices so nature-based solutions, as the, as the previous speaker was already um, telling us about, could be applied over this land, uh, and that can result in carbon sequestration by soils and plant biomass, or in the reduction or avoidance of greenhouse gas emissions. So developing carbon farming projects in Kazakhstan could be supported by trading of agri-land uh, soil-based carbon sequestration credits, and other financial mechanisms, such as sustainable land bonds, for example. So with this, uh, this kind of action can really connect people, nature, and economy in this uh, mutually reinforcing triad or nexus and generate multiple benefits, including new jobs, new streams of income, and enhanced uh, social inclusion. In case of Kazakhstan in particular, solution like carbon farming and trade could be actually especially suitable and helpful because this country performance on SDG 2, which is zero hunger, and SDG 13, which is climate action, is particularly low. And this is where the synergy can, can really be helpful. On the other hand, when designing specific policy, one has to take into account country-specific context. In this project, we make an attempt to quantify synergies and trade-offs between different SDGs in Kazakhstan using actually empirical data. So this exercise faces, of course, a challenge because data is, is very limited. But given, given the data that is available, we find, for example, that higher levels of agricultural production could be associated with higher water stress uh, levels and with higher levels of alcohol consumption. So this, this is based specifically on the context of Kazakhstan and data on the past, uh, past experience. So this observation, of course, underscores the importance of integrated policy approach supported by high quality data, which is currently missing, unfortunately, and, and high quality science. So with this very short contribution, uh, thank you for your attention. And we invite uh, all of you to study our materials on the website. And if anybody has questions or interest to discuss this topic with us, you are very much welcome to contact me over this email address here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Elena san, for sharing the uh, case study in Kazakhstan, um, Central Asia. Um, we will upload the your slide uh, when it's ready uh, uh, to, to our website too. So you know, yeah, let's uh, take a look at the more detail uh, in your website or our website. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, then um, next I would like to invite the um, also our very important partner, Ms. Lin Wagner. Senior Director of the Trust Progress Program. 
uh, International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD. Uh, so over to you, Lin San. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this really interesting conversation. Um, as we've heard, a lot of the, the action is gonna come at the local level. Um, we just heard about what's happening in Kazakhstan on the ground. We heard about uh, the importance of VLRs, voluntary local reviews. Um, over the weekend, we heard a lot about the importance of context, um, that local level. I'm gonna take us up to a much higher level, uh, but a really important part of um, the evidence that decision makers make when they decide what action to take. And that refers to um, what, uh, so a lot of um, decision makers rely on GDP uh, as their decision-making tool. Um, but this is a very old tool and it just measures the value of final goods and services produced in a country, which is not, um, helping us to achieve the synergies uh, and recognizing the true cost of the activities that went into uh, GDP measures, which were driving decision uh, making and action. Uh, so one project that ISD is currently involved in uh, is uh, evaluating and um, kind of proving how um, countries could take all this data that's available. So, you know, with the the 2030 agenda, we've got a lot of data coming in now. Um, but it's, you know, how do decision makers use it? How do we create indexes that would help them bring together these multiple points of data to help them with their decision making? Um, GDP is this very old measure uh, that's really antiquated now compared to what we're thinking about in the, um, the, the 2030 agenda. Um, so ISD has been working with uh, UNEP, um, some others, um, kind of before the Secretary General's Our Common Agenda came out, calling for this complementary measure of GDP, but it fits perfectly with this idea of beyond GDP. Um, and so right now we're working with universities in Ethiopia, Indonesia, and Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, to evaluate their existing data to, and to prove that the, the, the data exists and that they could create uh, what we're calling a comprehensive uh, wealth measure that would be complementary to GDP. Um, so I guess going back to one of the previous uh, speakers' uh, comments about, um, you know, uh, that we don't want to um, um, create mistrust in, in our measures. Um, there's so much built around GDP that um, it's not gonna be replaced anytime soon, but um, you know, what kind of decisions would be made and would be changed if governments had this complementary measure um, of uh, comprehensive wealth based on the five, um, five measures of, um, of uh, capital. So looking at not just finance and produce capital, but adding in natural capital, human capital, and social capital. Um, so that is something that we're working on. Um, and that is, um, you know, I think something that could really uh, be a game changer in um, bringing evidence to decision makers to drive uh, different actions. Thank you very much, Arlene San for yeah, sharing the um the your um ex, uh, the um activity. I also kindly comment on the uh, the uh, last speaker's presentation. Yeah, it's very kind of you. And then uh, yeah, ISD is quite the important media for us. And then uh, yeah, we yes um, definitely work together for having the uh, good synergy <laughs> for the uh, our future. So Arlene San, thank you very much. Always thank you. Okay, then now I would like to move to the uh, next segment, uh, special remarks. Um, yeah, yesterday there was the uh, fourth um, global synergy conference convened by co convened by the uh, UN DESA and also UN FCCC Secretariat. And then also the uh, there is the, um, the information sharing about the expert group. The one of the expert group member is our president uh, Takeuchi. 
And so I would like to invite the um, first uh, Mr. James uh, Grabat, uh, Director of the Mitigation um, Division, uh, UNFCCC Secretary. So um, James, over to you. Oh, thank you. It's it's my pleasure to join this event, uh, this side event. I'm, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Takuchi and I just for organizing this event and providing me with the opportunity to make some remarks. Um, friends and colleagues, uh, we're experiencing a range of crises globally, not only the climate, biodiversity, and pollution one we're talking about here, but others at the same time. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic caused an unprecedented health crisis, and we're still recovering from that. And today also many people and countries are suffering from the energy and food crises. And, and then there's a significant number of developing countries facing a debt crisis as well. So we're, we're in, in, in the midst of a large number of crises. And as a result, we have witnessed a reversal of sustainable development gains. We're not making the progress we need to make. So we need to tackle the crisis altogether. That is why it's essential where we leverage the synergies between, for example, climate action and the efforts to achieve the SDGs the Paris Agreement clearly states that it aims to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty, um, so including by holding the temperature increase to well below two degrees Celsius, as we all know. Um, the scientific evidence tells us the global average temperature has already increased 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial levels um, due to the cumulative greenhouse uh, gas emissions from human activities. Um, in order to limit this temperature rise, hopefully to 1.5 degrees, by, by 2030, we need emissions to be reduced by 43% from the 2019 levels. And, and we need to uh, reach net zero CO2 emissions around 2050 if we want to be on target for 1.5. But the current levels of commitments by the governments in their climate plans, the so-called nationally determined contributions, are indicating that global emissions will, de de will decrease only about a half a percent by 2030 instead of the needed 43%. This is the gap that science is, is, is pointing out to us. And, and scientific evidence also informs us uh, what we need to do. The report from the IPC, the, the recent report from the IPC described multiple opportunities for scaling up, excuse me, for scaling up climate action, such as cost-effective options to reduce emissions by 2030, as well as the synergies and trade-offs between climate action and sustainable development goals. The information is, is being presented. We're aware of it and we need to act on it. Um, the, the question is, is how we translate this evidence into action and how can we generate synergies between climate action and sustainable development in practice and how governments and stakeholders work together to achieve both the SDGs and the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and the regional focus, uh, uh, focus knowledge and learning opportunities can be a great way to identify effective climate action to, to you know, a bit more local, localization of the issue and, and policymakers, because the actionable solutions uh, obviously are gonna vary across national circumstances. So I welcome the focus of this event on, on Asia as the world's most populated and, and, and fast growing region. Um, so the outcome of this event, and, and, and along with what's been happening over the last few days in the high-level political forum, I hopefully will help governments and stakeholders to take the action to course correct and achieve the Paris Agreement while addressing the SDGs. Um, but it means we need nationally determined contributions with more ambitious commitments to reduce emissions and long-term low emission strategies that clearly lay out how they achieve the net zero emissions by or or, or around mid-century century and take account of the SDGs. So UNFC provides a space for governments to make political decisions and platforms for stakeholders to share their views, information, and ideas to promote climate action and international cooperation. And it's our hope that we can see accelerated climate action that is integrating efforts to address the SDGs. At this year's COP28 in Dubai, uh, it will provide the, a unique opportunity to, to, to do this course correct as we have the global stock take and stock take will show that we are not yet on the needed path. And, and pledges by governments and their implementation are far from enough. So the response to the talk, stock take will determine our success. And it's an opportunity to, to correct, um, both in terms of the efforts needed on climate change, but also in how we're integrating SDGs. Research and evidence continue to play an important role, as, as we've seen here today in some, some of the presentations. and, and um, they play an important role in making informed decisions in, in 
in implementing the policies and, and making all these investments that are necessary. So just let me reiterate the power of and to overcome the challenges. So let's work together to transform our economy to, and to have a better future for all of us. Uh, thank you. Ah, thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, even you are very busy. And um, then thank you for sharing the necessity of the um, sense of urgency and also yeah, the how to you know uh, use the global stock take to sharing the um like um synergy case study from the Asia Pacific especially. Ah, uh, thank you so much. Then now uh, I would like to invite the uh, Ms. Bahare Seadi, uh, Senior Sustainable Development Officer, UN Dessa. Yeah, um, congratulations for yesterday's um conference. And so, um, over to you, Bahare. Thank you so much, Junishi, and uh, thanks uh, also to IGES for the invitation to this um, event. We are very happy to take part. Um, and of course, we look forward to continuous uh, collaboration with IGES and uh, partners um, in this uh, event as well. So I've been given three minutes to talk about um, the Synergy Conference. As uh, it was mentioned, this was an event that was co-convened by uh, UN DESA and UNFCCC. It was the fourth global conference on this topic, and it happened yesterday. So um, I will focus my remarks on the uh, sort of recommendations that came out um, of the conference and how that relates to uh, the Asia Pacific region. And of course, James very clearly laid out the importance of this topic and why uh, we're working together to elevate um, a messaging on climate and SDG synergies. So let me share six key recommendations that emerged from um, the set of deliberations yesterday. Uh, the first one was about renewed leadership and political commitment to accelerate action on both the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. Uh, we all know that we are halfway to the deadline of 2030, and yet only 12% of the SDGs on our, are on track. And of course, we all know the IPCC's finding about the climate emergency being just around the corner as we have already reached the, a global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So a strong political leadership and commitment to accelerate action this coming decade is critical. There are some upcoming opportunities. James mentioned the importance of the global stock take and the COP28 that will happen later this year. Um, and there's also the SDG summit that will happen in September. There's a climate ambition summit um, that the SG is convening in September. These are all uh, immediate opportunities to showcase leadership and renewed uh, commitment. And I think the Asia Pacific region has a big role to play given the important progress that we see and the good examples coming from that region. Um, second uh, recommendation was about deepen deepening the evidence base. And this uh, side event today, it really points to the importance of data and analysis and how um, we need to demonstrate uh, synergies and trade-offs by evidence. And that's how we will influence the decision-making progresses. And, and in that sense, um, Professor Takeuchi mentioned there is a um, expert group on climate and SDG synergies that was launched uh, earlier this year by UNDESA and, and um, UNFCCC. And the idea here is really to look at what are the gaps in terms of data analysis and how can we build on that. The first report of the expert group will um, be launched in September this year, and we hope that uh, this first report will lay the path for a more comprehensive assessment um, in future years that could form the basis for um, an analysis that could assess, uh, monitor, and report climate and SDG synergy action in a more effective way. The third recommendation was about integrating the importance of integrating just transition in development and implementation of the country's nationally determined contributions or national climate plans, as well as development plans. Um, there, if you look at the NDCs, we see that many of them uh, don't recognize the SDGs. Um, and similarly, if you look at development plans and the VNRs, for example, uh, we don't see climate change being reflected um, as it should. So integrating and 
uh, improving coherence of national instruments is critical. And, and secondly, these kind of instruments can also be an opportunity to harness um, just transition and make sure there is um, inclusive processes that benefit um, all. Um, the third, the, the fourth recommendation was about taking into account existing inequalities in providing financial and technical support to enable just transition. And there, the conversation is really about recognizing that pursuing just transition is going to be difficult for all countries at all stages of development. However, um, developing countries in particular face um, distinct difficulties and challenges, and that needs to be taken account. So as we move towards uh, provision of financial and technical support for the transitions that countries are making, we need to be mindful of the in existing inequalities. So that was one of the key messages coming out of the conference as well. Um, the fifth recommendation was about strengthening multi-stakeholder cooperation and dialogues at all levels. Um, we do know that this uh, work around strengthening climate and SDG synergies has to be mainstreamed at all levels of government, yet it's not just governments who can deliver on this. It really is um, the job of everyone. All stakeholders have a role to play, and there um, the recommendation is to strengthen multi-stakeholder dialogues and cooperation at all levels global, regional, and local. And, 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 and we think that in, in these uh, global synergy conferences could play an effective role in that sense. There will be a fifth conference coming up next year. Um, and we hope uh, to provide that as a platform again for uh, reinvigorating action by multi-stakeholders. In addition to that, uh, we are looking at regional dialogues. For example, the upcoming um, climate weeks, um, including the one in the Asia Pacific, could provide a unique platform to integrate this conversation around um, climate and SDG synergies at the regional level. And last recommendation was about leveraging intergovernmental processes to enhance integrated approaches and synergistic action. And here again, uh, there's a plethora of intergovernmental processes, whether it's about um, the high level political forum, the General Assembly in New York, or the Conference of the Parties under the UNFCCC, um, the CBD COPs, uh, the UNCCD COPs, the IPCC, the upcoming SIDS conference in 2024. There is a number of opportunities here at the intergovernmental level to look at synergistic action across all these sectors. Um, we continue to see these communities working in isolation. Uh, and, and having sort of conversations around these themes in separation. And yet we think there needs to be a better connection between intergovernmental processes and enhancing synergies across. Um, with that, I'd like to um, end uh, my remarks. I encourage everyone um, on this call to join the conversation. Um, again, I think Asia Pacific region provides a a set of really good examples in terms of not only evidence, but also commitment to action. And we, we certainly would like to collaborate to um, leverage that. Um, thank you so much. Over to you, Junichi. Yeah, thank you very much, Bahari, for sharing the yesterday's very, you know, hot <laughs> atmosphere from your side. And then, uh, yeah, I recommend all the participants to visit the uh, UNDS website to the, about the last yesterday's conference. So, yeah, we definitely need to share the good case study, synergy case study from Asia Pacific. Thank you very much, Bahari. Okay, I, I'm sorry, yeah, it's, uh, we, uh, we are a bit over the time, but the, uh, I also need to invite very, very important uh, collaborator um, uh, from UNIAS. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Shinobu Yume Yamaguchi-san for her closing remarks. Uh, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the, of the United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of the Sustainability, I am pleased to share my closing remarks. In particular, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to all of the speakers and participants 
for your insightful knowledge and experiences shared today. I also extend my appreciation to the organizers and partners for providing this platform, a catalyzed transformative action. Today's session provided an opportunity for rich dialogue centering around the critical theme of translating evidence into action for climate and SDG synergies. This year, the United Nations University contributed as a panelist for the fourth synergy conference held just yesterday in New York at the UN headquarters. I am delighted to witness the building the momentum on the climate and SDG synergies across the region. This year present us with a significant milestone for assessment and renewed commitment to action through, including this high-level political forum and SDG summit in September and at COP28 later this year. Our institute is engaging our policy-oriented research, educational programs with our partnerships. For example, in, in April this year, we played a key role as a co-chair of the Think7 Task Force on Wellbeing, Environmental Sustainability, and Just Transition. We offered the policy solutions to renew actions for the SDGs carbon neutrality and climate resilience, the development, bringing the G7 and G20 countries together. Our policy recommendations specifically called for an action to deliver universal access to carbon neutrality to the energy systems to ensure the sustainable food systems and biodiversity conservation to synergize resilience and social protection, and most importantly, to enhance measurement for the well being. I am very happy to announce from this September, the United Nations University will offer the new postgraduate program specializing in climate action for the Paris Agreement. This program are, de are designed to develop the future leaders with the knowledge and skills needed to implement the Paris Agreement and to address knowledge gaps on synergies. We will implement this program in collaboration with our partner institutions in the UN system and academia. We look forward to our further collaboration for our report on climate and SDG synergies. Transformation requires mobilizing actions across the society. I am confident through our partnership between the stakeholders gathered in this event, we can make a valuable contribution toward achieving a more sustainable, equitable, and resilient the future. Let us carry forward this momentum and redouble our commitment to translating evidence into synergies action on climate and SDGs in Asia and beyond. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yamaguchi, for sending the uh, closing remarks. Um, so um, the, all the um, session are uh, uh, concluded, and then uh, thank you for joining the today's session, especially the speakers, and there are also the participants uh, from the uh, Japan. Uh, it's very late night time. Um, thank you so much. All the slide videos or uh, today's recording uh, will be uploaded soon, so please check it if you'd like to uh, look more detail. Um, I'm sorry, this time we cannot accept any comments or questions or also proposals. So then if you have any um, things, and then please send us uh, the IGS email or to my email directly, Fujinata IGS or JP. And so finally, uh, thanks to all the participants, speakers again. 
And then uh, let's make the um, very good the synergy uh, case study actions uh, with all of you. So thank you very much for joining today's session. And then I very much appreciate your kind attendance uh, from New York. Thank you so much.